Creating content is hard. It can feel totally overwhelming and stop you from actually getting started creating the stuff that you really want to create. But there are ways to reduce the friction and speed up the process. And that's what I'm going to be sharing today. Hi, I'm Bev and I've been trying to grow my channel now for well over a year. And one of the biggest hurdles has been consistently creating content, which is key for growth. The biggest issues have been finding the time, overthinking what I want to create, making it way more complicated than it needs to be, aiming for perfection, which doesn't even exist, and just getting completely overwhelmed by the whole process. But a few weeks ago, I decided that if something didn't change, I was going to have to quit. And I'd have to wave goodbye to all of my YouTube goals and dreams. And I really didn't want to have to do that. So I'm going to share with you today some of the things that I've been doing lately to help speed up the process, reduce the friction, and enable me to create more content more consistently. So I've been able to put out on average three videos a week plus a live stream and also repurpose some of that content so I can use it on other platforms without adding hours and hours more to my working day. So I've got six tips for you today and I'm also going to share my week three YouTube analytics so you can see that if what I'm doing is actually working. So stick around Let's dive into those tips. Okay, so tip number one is quite simple. It's about keeping an ideas bank. Coming up with ideas is probably one of the hardest parts of the creation process. But we have ideas all of the time. But if we don't capture them there and then, they're like little birds and they just disappear into the sky and they're gone. So we need to hang on to them when they get here. So I use the Notion app on my phone. Notion is a, a productivity and time management software. And I like to have it on my phone so that I can easily capture any ideas that I have when I have them. You could quite easily use the notes app on your phone. I'll just keep a little notebook with you, but you need to make sure that you've got it with you all of the time for when those ideas strike. And if they strike you while you're in the shower, Obviously, don't have your phone in the shower with you. <laughs> Here's like a sub tip to tip number one. Once I've got that idea and I've got it written down, I will then jump onto ChatGPT and I'll put that idea in as a prompt and ask it to give me seven more video title ideas that I could use to create a series around that initial idea. Now, sometimes they come out great, sometimes they don't. And it doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to always create that series sequentially, but it does mean that I've now got seven new ideas from that one original idea and they go into my notion for the future. Okay, tip number two is about keeping things simple when it comes to filming. I've got fancy cameras and fancy microphones, but if I'm honest, I found that the easiest thing is to just go and use my phone. Why? Because the best camera is the camera that you're going to use. And generally speaking, your phone camera is going to be good quality these days. And you've probably always got it with you. Using the fancy equipment meant that I was getting myself tied up in knots, trying to make sure all the settings were right. I had all the time it takes to set it up. And then the transfer time, getting stuff off the camera onto my editing software. And it was just taking up a lot of time. And quite often when I'd set it all up and recorded, because I'm not a great photographer and I don't really understand all the fancy settings in the camera, I would come out with something that I wasn't particularly happy with anyway. And yet every time I use my phone, I tend to get something that I like. Now, I do have a DJI Osmo Pocket 3, which I'm recording on now, which I absolutely love. But I don't always have it with me and I don't always have it charged. And quite honestly, your phone is good enough. And if like me, you've got something like an iPhone, I've got the iPhone 15 Pro. You probably find that even the front facing camera, which are notoriously not as good quality as the rear facing camera, is good enough. And 
what that allows you to do is frame yourself well in the video because if you're using the rear camera you can't see what you're filming so you've got to kind of keep going back and setting things up or if you've got an apple watch you can link it to your apple watch but sometimes they don't connect and it's a bit glitchy so do you know what if all else fails just use the front camera on your phone i would just not get too close to it because it can distort your face a little bit so have a little bit of distance between you but just use your phone that's absolutely fine and the truth is i don't even worry too much about using an external microphone these days there are some brilliant tools ai tools that you can use in editing that will fix any not so great sound in descript it's called studio sound CapCut has something called enhanced voice. So if your sound quality isn't as good as you want it, you can always boost it in editing. So don't even let not having a microphone stop you from creating the video. It can all be corrected very, very easily in the editing process. Tip number three is to throw away the script. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a format and some notes for your video but if you're scripting word for word unless you are a mega brilliant typist like 120 words a minute typist it's going to take time to write that script out in full rather than do that just have bullet points on a scrap of paper just in a in a notepad something like this and just have the, the key points you want to get across in your video sketched out for me, for this video, I wrote the hook out in full because I knew I would want to get that right. That's the first 30 to 60 seconds or so of the video that kind of tells you what the video is going to be about. And I did write out the introduction because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. But after that, all of these tips are just bullet points with a few little notes. And I'm talking to the camera, taking a pause, reading my notes, coming back to the camera, and talking the next bit through. And I just cut out those gaps in the edit. I'll leave that one in so you see what I mean. Okay. Um, so scripting is a just a time suck. And unless you're recording something that needs a lot of accuracy and a lot of statistics and facts, you don't need to script. You know your stuff. You don't need a script to be able to read from. I also think when you're reading from a script, it looks like you're reading from a script. And unless you're very adept at using a teleprompter, which by the way, is just another piece of equipment that you're gonna to have to set up, it's going to sound forced. It's not going to sound natural. So get rid of the script. You don't need it. Bullet points will do you just fine. If you do feel like you need a little bit more detail than just the bullet points though, Again, don't script it all out. That will just take a lot of time. Have just perhaps some written notes. And if you feel you just need a little bit of a reminder, say one sentence, then pause, go and read your notes, read the next sentence, come back, say the next sentence, stop, pause, go back to your script or your, your notes, read the next sentence and come back and say it again. And if you leave a nice pause between each sentence. When you're doing your editing, you'll be able to easily see in the, the sound wave where those gaps are. So you can very easily go in and just cut out the gaps in your first rough edit very, very easily. In fact, if you use Descript, it will take out those word gaps and you can tell it how long you want the word gap to be. So it sounds natural. So don't worry about scripting at all. Talking about editing, tip number five is about keeping the edits as simple as possible. It used to be trendy to have fast cuts and lots of B-roll and lots of overlays and titles popping up here, there and everywhere. And the idea was that constantly changing the scene kept the audience engaged. It's called retention editing. In reality, the trend now seems to be moving away from retention editing and much more towards more a more simplified, slower pace of editing. And especially for us Gen Xers, I don't know about you, but I find some of those really fast cuts where they literally take out every um and ah and every breath. So it looks like the creator doesn't even draw a breath. 
I actually find that quite off-putting. I find I need a little bit of time to absorb what they've said before they move on to the next bit. So keeping your editing as simple as possible is going to save you a lot of time. Yes, you want to go in and tidy it up and take out any obvious bloopers, but a few ums and ahs in there and uh, a little bit of breathing space while you're, you're thinking about what you want to say isn't going to be a problem, especially not if you're aiming at a Gen X and a boomer audience, a sort of later life audience, because we want things a little bit slower. We don't need all the fast cuts. In addition, there are some really great editing tools now that can give you a transcription that you edit and it will simultaneously edit the video. Descript is the original. In my opinion, I still think it's the best. So basically, when you upload load your raw footage into Descript, it will create a transcript, like a Word document. And then you can go through and you can take out any unwanted sentences or words that you didn't want in there. And you cut them out just as if you were cutting out a word in a Word document, but it will simultaneously be editing the video for you. Now, you can do a full edit in Descript. I don't do that. What I tend to do is my first draft in Descript. So I'll go in and I will ask it to take out the word gaps and take out any ums and ers that if I've got way too many in there, I don't mind leaving a few in, but you can ask it to identify all of the ums and ers and you can just take it out in one go. It takes minutes. Then I export that and I move it into CapCut and that's where I do some of the, the final tinkering on the video, adding music and things like that. Although you don't need to even add music, there would be another way to speed up the editing process. I just quite like having music on there and it doesn't take me that long. I've got a bank of music that I know I like to use. So there are softwares that can really speed up the editing process, Descript being one of them. CapCut is a free editing tool and I really love it. It makes life very easy. Try to keep your editing as simple as possible. Nice, straightforward head to camera videos, talking head videos, they call them, like this one is, work perfectly well. You don't need all of the fancy cuts and B-roll and, and all of the other enhancements. The trend is moving away from that, so you don't need to worry about it. Okay, so I promised I would share my week three YouTube analytics. So before I give you the final tip, which is an absolute banger of a tip, I'm going to take you over to my computer and I'm just going to go quickly through my YouTube analytics for this week and we can have a look and see if what I'm trying to do now is working. Okay, so here we are. We're over on my spreadsheet. So this is my YouTube growth stats since the 9th of August. So I haven't been tracking my stats for very long. And if I want to grow, I know I need to do this. And I really need to look at the analytics to know if this change in content creation uh, strategy that I'm using is actually working. So I started on the 9th of August. I did last week's stats. There's a video. Uh, I'll put it somewhere up here if you want to watch last week's. Um, and now we're on to week three, although it's in reality, it's two weeks of data. The red, it looks orange on video, but it, it looks red on my screen, is where the numbers have decreased and the green is where the numbers have increased. And I'll talk you through quickly what it is I'm tracking. So first of all, I'm tracking the number of views overall that I've had in the last seven days. So between the 15th of August and the 22nd, it'll be the 16th to the 22nd, um, I'm tracking views. And my views have actually gone down, which I'm not, I'm trying really hard not to kind of get attached to whether they've gone up or down, but just look objectively at what that means. So I've got a 42.8, so nearly a 43% decrease in the number of views. Doesn't surprise me hugely because last week, or rather the week before my brother, who has a, a, a reasonable sized channel, promoted my channel to his subscribers. And a lot of them came and had a little watch of my stuff and very kindly subscribed. So it's probably skewed the numbers a little bit from what they would have been had I just been putting out content normally. 
So I've seen a decrease in views and I've also seen a decrease in watch time. This is obviously the amount of time that my videos have actually been watched. And this is, um, again, not a surprise, bearing in mind that I had that boost from my brother. So the decrease this week is nearly 40%, uh, nearly, sorry, I beg your pardon, nearly 33%. My average view duration, however, has gone up. That's the amount of time people are spending watching individual videos. Um, so that has gone up by 33%, which is good. The average view duration is an indicator of whether the audience are enjoying the video or not. So obviously we want to get that percentage up. Next, I measure my click through rate. This is the amount of time somebody clicks on a video when it shows up in suggested or in browse. If they see an impression of that video, if they click on it, that is my click through rate. Again, that is down on last week by 2.4%. So all of this, I think, is skewed a little bit because of the boost that I got from my brother. So I'm going to track over 20 weeks. So that should, by the end of the 20 weeks, iron out any blips that are sort of um, anomalies, if you like. Um, I've also tracked my total subscriber count and whilst I didn't have as big an increase as I did last week, <laughs> last week I had 34% increase, this week that's down to 2%. But again, a lot of my brother's subscribers very kindly came and subscribed to my channel, which get, has given it that big boost. So I haven't seen the same level of growth, but I have acquired 18 new subscribers. So although this box is red, I'm actually really happy with that. Uh, what doesn't add up, and I don't really understand why, is I've got these numbers from YouTube Studio. But if you take 804 from 821, it doesn't give you 18, it gives you 17. But YouTube was showing me 18. So there was a point at which it was 822 and then I lost a subscriber. So maybe that's where the anomaly has come. Um, so we've got a decrease of 185%, but an overall increase of my subscribers. So I'm very happy with that. The next things that I'm measuring are where I'm showing up, so where people are finding me. And up until this week, I didn't have YouTube search in here. I was only looking at suggested and browse. So suggested are when, if you're watching a video, YouTube will suggest other videos by other creators that are similar to what you're watching. And you normally see them down the right-hand side at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Um, Browse is when you open your home page in YouTube and these are sort of the videos that YouTube wants to put in front of you based on what it's choosing to put out. I think I'm sounding really vague. I don't really know. Uh, so I've been tracking those for the last couple of weeks, but I've added in YouTube search. Now, I don't optimize for search. I'm optimizing, I think, or trying to for browse and suggested but I've added YouTube search in here because the numbers were a little bit interesting. So if we look at the amount of times my videos showed up in suggested, it has gone up. Uh, it's gone up by 101, near, near enough 101.5%, point four. let's not quibble about a point one of a percent, uh, which is great and that's ideal. So I think what that means is that my videos are being recommended to people who are watching things that YouTube thinks my videos are going to be similar to. What I need to find a way of doing is figuring out which videos I'm being suggested on uh, just to make sure that they are in alignment with what I want to put out there in my audience because if I'm getting that wrong they'll be suggesting my videos to the wrong audience so at least that's what I think. Browse is up as well. Um, I'm very happy to be showing in browse. Uh, that's up by 56.7%. What I need to do though or rather what I wanted to show you was the YouTube search. So YouTube search is when somebody actually physically goes in and searches for keywords that are in my content. And as I say, I don't really optimize for search, but I do do keyword research really is to let YouTube know 
what I'm talking about so it can show it to the right people. But it does appear that I'm turning up in search. So there was a 51% increase on last week. And even last week, when I wasn't tracking it, I've gone back and tracked my numbers. There was an increase there as well, although I haven't done the percentage there. So impressions, as I said, that was how many times my thumbnails and titles were shown in either browser suggested. And this number has gone down um, by 40 and a half percent. So I don't know what drives the impressions. I don't know what I can do to increase the number of impressions. I don't know if it's maybe when I post. I don't know if it's how soon I get interaction on the videos to let YouTube know that potentially they need to show it to more people. I'm still not 100% certain how to improve that metric, but it is down. So we'll live with that. Um, and I've also added these final three columns, which are the number of videos, shorts and lives that I've done, just so that I have an understanding of, am I creating more content, less content? The last couple of uh, weeks, as you can see, I've tried to be more prolific in posting. Um, what I have done, though, is drop, <laughs> drop the shorts. I'm not sure that's quite what I meant, but I've dropped creating shorts. It's just another task that is going to take up time and I'd rather spend that time creating longer form content. From my understanding, shorts are really good for increasing your subscriber numbers, but not your watch time. And at the minute, my subscriber count is at 800 and it's actually a little bit more than that now. I think it's 824. So I'm getting close to the thousand threshold for um, reaching that monetization bracket. What I'm nowhere near yet is the watch hours. I'm not tracking watch hours and it's because in YouTube studio, the monetization numbers or the monetization data seems to be a few days behind. But if I go into my uh, YouTube studio app here on my phone and look at my earn tab, I can see I've already reached the threshold of 500 subscribers for the first tier of monetization, which is things like um, memberships and supers, but I'm still nowhere near on the watch hours. So you need 3000 watch hours and 500 subscribers to get that first threshold and to reach the full threshold where you can apply to be part of the YouTube partner program. I'd need a thousand subscribers and 4,000 watch hours. And at the minute, um, I don't know if you'll be able to see that, maybe back to front actually. But basically I've got 1,407, 1,407 public watch hours as of the 18th of August. It's now the 23rd, so it's about five days behind. So in terms of doing shorts, I don't really want to take the time to do shorts. I don't know that they necessarily drive that many people back to my longer form content. So if I'm going to spend time creating content, I'm going to put the time where I think it's going to have the most impact. And I think that's going to be longer form content so I can hopefully try and get my watch time up. So that's it for the stats. I hope you found that helpful. As I say, I'm still learning with all of this. It's by no means meant to be teaching you how to do this. And if anybody can help me understand the data a little bit better, please let me know in the comments. It's more just to give you an understanding of what it is I'm tracking and the rationale that I have for tracking these numbers. So that's it for the stats. Well, let's head back and I'll give you this final tip, which I have to tell you, you're gonna love it. Okay guys, tip number six is to save time by repurposing your content. Nobody has time to be creating brand new content for every single platform that you're on. So using the power of AI to do this for you is a game changer. For example, a few weeks ago, I recorded an interview for my Generation Exceptional podcast with ADHD expert Karen McGill, and it was a brilliant conversation. And I wanted to use that content to create an article for LinkedIn. But I didn't want to have to write the whole thing from scratch. 
So using Descript, I copied the YouTube link from that video into Descript and it transcribed the whole conversation for me. Then using Descript's built-in AI, which is called Underlord, I asked it to repurpose that into a blog article. It took seconds and it created an article that I could literally copy and paste into LinkedIn. I didn't copy and paste it directly. I did go in and I did a, a few tweaks, made sure that I was happy with the way it sounded. I'd given Descript some prompts to make sure that it transcribed it in nice plain English in a warm conversational manner. And I asked it to add subheadings at key points throughout the video. And it did a great job. So once I've done a couple of tweaks, I copied it into LinkedIn and then dived into Canva, created a simple cover graphic using their templates and uploaded it onto LinkedIn. I also included a link to the actual video because hopefully that will encourage people to watch the video. That will help with my watch time and hopefully maybe help me get a few new subscribers. And the whole process took less than 15 minutes. So with that article written, you could then push that through ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT to create you some social media posts, small bite-sized posts from that article. And that way you can always be linking it back to the video. So you ask it to create a Facebook post and then you put, if you want to see the whole conversation, click on this link and it'll take them back to your YouTube channel. So you're using that content repurposed, you're not reinventing the wheel and you're using AI to help save you time and mental energy. So there you go, I hope you found that helpful. If you found it useful, please do smash the like button and let me know in the comments, what are your top tips for speeding up the creation process? What have I missed out here? Because I'm always looking for good tips too. I'll talk to you next time.